Hello and welcome to Chinivision. This time we're going to burst some balloons. Originally known as Buster Brothers, but we know it in the UK as Pang. This was an arcade hit in the late 80s, early 90s, known as the fantastically named Pomping World in Japan, apparently. So you can make your own jokes there. I guess it would have come to most people's attention when Ocean acquired the license around the same time they got Rainbow Islands and the other arcade games, although they were mainly concentrating at the movie licenses at that time. It's a simple concept. We travel the world through 50 levels and 17 stages uh, spread across the world and disperse the balloons. Every time you hit a balloon, it splits in two until you hit the smallest balloon, which disappears. You've got these things referred to as wires, but look more like spears. They've got the screen that you can hit and you get various power-ups, such as invulnerability and double harpoons. Let's, let's call them harpoons because they're easier. Things to stop the bubbles in their tracks for a limited amount of time and a catapult as well. There's also a two-player cooperative mode, which is really good fun and various other power-ups throughout the game. Ocean acquired the license and ported it to all the home systems, the Spectrum Commodore Amstrad and the Amiga NST, and I believe there's also an MS-DOS version as well, which I haven't seen. We're going to start off on the Atari ST. Nice Ocean logo at the beginning. This game was developed by ARC Developments, or maybe called Arc Developments, I don't know, in France for Ocean. Waiting for the ST to load up. We're just going to start. We've got four difficulty levels there. Easy, difficult, and uh, two more that have gone by quite fast. On the ST version, you can only select the first two stages to start from on the map. Although on the arcade, I believe you can actually select anywhere around to about Paris to start. Which is a slight frustration here on some of these versions that you can't do that, but you can in the arcade. We start off, I've now, I've now got the catapult there, which um, I've, that's gone badly. It's, it's playing these different versions back to back. The bounce in the different versions can be slightly diff different. It's difficult to explain if you haven't played these versions back to back. I think on the ST and Amiga, the balls bounce slightly higher, but not as far apart. So we clear level one. And you can burst those blocks at the top. They can't burst all blocks that you can see on the screens, but some of them you can. That dynamite will split all the bubbles down into the sm their smallest constituent parts. So it can be quite a dangerous thing to get um, because you can be overwhelmed with bubbles. Well, are we calling these bubbles or balloons? I'm I'm not sure. I'll probably swap between the between the two. Let's get the last one. Player two can join any time which can be quite handy for playing single player because when you're on your last life, you can flip to player two by pressing fire on the second joystick and then have six more lives, which can be quite handy to get you further into the game. The catapult can't destroy the blocks and there's also little animals that go past the screen like this snail thing. If you touch him, you can't fire for a few seconds. There's also a little crab who comes along who will help burst the bubbles, which can be a hindrance as well. And there's various birds that fly across the screen, which again can be a help or a hindrance because they will burst the bubbles when they hit them, but that can put your own plans out in the way you're planning on tackling the, the bubbles. I say Y tune here on the ST, we're going to be hearing a lot more of the AY tunes across the various versions. So we completed stage one, off to stage two, which is Mount Kirin. Different tune on the background. We just flipped over straight to the Amiga here. The two versions are very similar, although the Amiga version has a slightly nicer sound and far more colours. Other than that, they play absolutely identically.
There's very little between the ST and Amiga versions, really. The gameplay-wise, they appear to be absolutely identical. The thing about the birds as well is if your harpoon touches them, then the harpoon disappears. So again, if you mistime it and you're planning on hitting a bubble or a balloon, suddenly the harpoon's not there. The hourglass, when that drops down, slows the balls down. Again, I'm calling them balls bubbles. I, I don't really know what they are, balloons. Overall on the ST and Amiga, really good conversion of the arcade game. Very polished. Well worth playing. Moving over to the Commodore 64. On the 64, the game was a cartridge-only game, but I am playing a version that has been cracked and put onto disc, and then I'm running it off my 1541 Ultimate. So the loading times will be increased from the cartridge, where it would have been near instantaneous. Start off on Mount Fuji and um, large bubble there. I'm on the catapult now, but I'm sure there's something odd going on with the uh, with the harpoon graphic. Let's have a look at that. The bubbles don't seem to build as high on the C64 version as some of the other versions. And yes, look at this. This is weird. The harpoon is a block that fires up, but it doesn't disappear the second it hits something. The bottom continues travelling up, and you can't fire again until the entire harpoon has disappeared. Which is what makes the game quite difficult, because on the other versions, as soon as the harpoon touches something, it disappears and you can fire again. But on the C64, if it touches something, you've got to wait until the bottom of the harpoon has reached the top, so to speak, and then you can fire again. So you can end up trapped in situations where... On the other versions, you would have been able to fire again, but on the 64, you can't. Being a cartridge game, there would have been a big lead time from having finished the game to getting games into the shops, because the data would have been sent to the Far East to be manufactured into a cartridge, and then shipped back by sea, which takes about eight nine weeks. Unlike a tape or cassette version, which can be duplicated in a matter of a, in, in under a week. And I just get the feeling that Ocean may have been under some pressure to get this game finished and that perhaps Pang on the C64 is a game that isn't finished because it, it had to be delivered much earlier than the other versions. On the 64, the game looks the part. Well, aside from those bubble sprites that look quite bland compared to the other versions. There's no shading on there that you get even on the Spectrum version. But it looks the part. It sounds the part. Pity it doesn't play the part. The Spectrum, would, of course, would have had no such lead time problems. Standard plus three disc or cassette. Multi-load between the stages. Well, no, it's not particularly horrific. It gets over with fairly quickly. It just has to load the graphics in for the background. Perhaps it would have been nice to have an option to turn those graphics off, like Street Fighter 2. Same music as the ST, and off we go. Appears to be a monochrome version of the 16-bit versions, really. Got the proper harpoon, unlike the C64, although... I'm noticing here that when you press fire... Hmm. Let's go on to stage two and just see if I can confirm this. It feels like when you press fire, you're not moving, and you only start moving when you release fire. Yeah. Now, on all the other versions... I'll forward this on now. On all the other versions, when you press fire, you can basically run and press fire at the same time. So you're, you can run under a balloon without stopping... But here on the Spectrum, all the time you've got fire pressed, you're not moving. Which makes the game fundamentally more difficult. 
Let's move this on to Paris, one of the later levels. I'm playing on the Spectrum here with a, a cheat. Actually, I'm not. It's, it's not even a hacked version. There's a very nice built-in cheat on the Spectrum version. You press pause twice, and off you go. Basically, you can skip forward um, a level at a time. As you go through the game, obviously it gets more difficult. That means more balloons. It also means the power-ups can be more frustrating at times in that you'll get things like the dynamite dropping at the least appropriate moment, where just when you don't want a million balloons to descend on you. Speaking of a million balloons, it's fair to say that while the Spectrum version is moving okay at the moment, when there's a lot going on, it does suffer from slowdown if you suddenly do burst all the balloons, and we'll see if we can do that in a bit. The game massively slows down. Time limits on the original game were fairly tight, and here on the Spectrum there's, they've, they've kept that. And when you get down to 40 seconds or so, this different music starts on in the background to make you hurry up. Hopefully I'm going to finish off this, this level. I wonder if I can do this in the next 10 seconds. That one. Oh yes, I've still got it. Even though I'm cheating on this version, but I did genuinely clear that level. The final level of the game is Easter Island, and here we go, here's the slowdown problem. That's it, it massively slows down there. The Spectrum version doesn't have all of the music from the arcade for memory reasons, so some of the tunes do repeat. And again, there we go. Now, there's an elephant in the room here, guys. As I constantly remind everybody, on Chinivision, we use the original hardware. Every version you've seen so far has been from a real ST, a real Amiga 1200, a real C64, and a real Grey Spectrum Plus 2. Now, GX4000 is difficult for me, because although I'd really love to own one, I've blown four of them up. And when you've blown four GX4000s up, it, it's a bit of a hint that you perhaps shouldn't own any more. So we're going to have to do what I don't like doing and play the GX4000 version of Pang under emulation. There is no standard CPC version. However, there's a nice little story with this version of Pang. We're playing my cartridge. Back in the late 90s, when the first CPC Plus emulators appeared, there was a cry out on the Amstrad 8-bit forum on Usenet for cartridges to be transferred so we could play games on the emulator. And I sent my cartridges off to this guy who transferred them all. One of them was Pang. And today, chances are, if you're playing GX4000 version of Pang on an emulator, you're playing my cartridge. I have to say one really important thing here on the emulation. The balloons, balls, whatever, on the GX4000 Amstrad Plus version move at 50 frames a second. They're really, really smooth. But because I'm capturing the emulation, we're not getting that full animation. So bear in mind, everything that's a sprite here on the GX4000 version is absolutely smooth as anything. So, you know, it's not jerky as you see this moving around here. It really is smooth and absolutely lovely. The GX4000 version was reviewed by Amstrad Action in, I think, June or July. They said it had just come out, which was a surprise to me, because I bought my copy in Dixon's in Guildford at the beginning of December 1990. So I'd had it for pretty much six months. So I don't know what was going on there with Ocean sending them the game that late and how I managed to get a copy in December the previous year. But I got it, and I was really, really impressed. It's of absolutely fantastic game colourful all the attributes of the arcade the balloon sprites are a bit, a bit smaller than the arcade version some of the tunes do repeat just to save memory at times but it's so polished it's even got a little extra tune here on the world map screen that even the arcade version doesn't have
it's just so nice. The graphics are a little bit blocky on the sprites perhaps, but this is running on the Amstrad's Mode Nought. And I just can't say when people knock the GX4000, they just ignore games like this that are so absolutely brilliant. They say, oh, Pang's good on the Amiga, I can play it on the Amiga. But this actually feels like a real console game on the GX4000. It's just been console-fied. The graphics are a little bit more compact. It's absolutely wonderful. I just can't say how good this game is on the GX4000. It gave me hundreds of hours of fun. And the two-player mode works as well, and it works really well. Up next is the India level, and on stage one of this, there's a knack to doing it. So let's see if I can remember right. Pow, pow, pow. Five again. Right, an invulnerability should come down somewhere. Double spears. Yep, go. Invulnerable. Right. Get all of these bubbles. Come on, come on, come on. I can do this. I can remember how to do this. Oh, yep, yeah, no. Good, good. Zap, zap. Got him. Right, one more. Come on. Oh, yes. Who's the daddy? You know, my game playing skills are pretty rubbish, but despite not having played Pang on GX4000 for absolutely ages, probably five or six years, I can still do it. <laughs> Brilliant. And this game puts such a smile on my face, it really does. The other versions are good, and yeah, I'm not playing as an original hardware, and it breaks my heart not to be playing on original hardware, but it's so good. Every time I see a GX4000 on eBay, I think, oh, I could buy one. But I just know, I just know what will happen. They, they just self-combust in my presence. It's My first one went back under warranty, got the replacement, that blew up just over a year later. Got a third, that failed, got a fourth, pretty much went the same way. Some of them failed due to the Amstrad power supplies. They must be avoided. Do not use an Amstrad power supply with your GX4000. It will fail. There's a 50-50 chance it will take the GX4000 with it. There's something, there's a design fault in there somewhere. Get a modern switch mode power supply or power it from an Amstrad monitor using 5 volts. Sorry, we're supposed to be talking about Pang, right. On to Leningrad, and this level is tricky. See all those gaps between the platforms? If the small bubbles get between those, because of the game's gravity, they will they go they will migrate to the top and come up from underneath you. Or they will roll along the top because they can't bounce. And this is the game physics, which is really, really the integral part of the game. Here comes the crab. Oh no. Pang. Well, it's a fantastic arcade game, and the Amiga and ST versions are really, really good. Can't really say much about them because they're faithful ports of the arcade, a few little things missing here and there, but they're good. C64 version, it's not as good as the other version, I'm afraid. Even if they'd finished off the Harpoon graphics, it's still not quite right. And as a cartridge game, it feels like something's been rushed through to be converted to get enough time to manufacture the cartridges, if I'm honest. The Spectrum version came in the, I think about 74 of the top 100 games in your Sinclair of all time. And this somehow completely ignores the fact that if you hold down fire, your sprite can't move, which I'm afraid for me is game breaking. It's a slower game on the Spectrum, which you'd expect, but that fire problem is game breaking. It just you can't run underneath a bubble and burst it because you come to a grinding halt and you just can't time things. Perhaps if you've only ever played the Spectrum version, you won't find it a problem. But somebody who's come from the Amstrad GX4000 version and the other versions, I do find it a problem. Speaking of the GX4000, oh, it's unmitigated joy. Every time someone takes the Mickey out of the GX4000 just show them bang. 
It's the best version. It's fantastic. It's so well put together. If Alan Sugar had had five games like Pang for the GX4000, perhaps the console wouldn't have failed, but it probably would have failed because the marketing was so abysmal. But you know what I mean? It shows off what the console can do. It's better than 99% of games on the NES or Master System. And Mega Drive's got nothing like this. The SNES version of Pang only has one player. Pang on the GX4000 is absolute perfection. And I would challenge anyone to say otherwise. They might say the collision detection isn't very good. Well, it's not very good on any of the versions if you start looking at it. It's a bit squiffy on the 16-bit versions and even the arcade versions. So you can't really throw that accusation at it. The, there's a few tunes missing, but they've had to get this on a fixed size cartridge. And they've got more in than the C64 version. They've got more in than a multi-load Spectrum version. As I said, the GX4000 version of Pang is unmitigated joy. It's a must-own. And if you can't get the cartridge, play it under emulation. Simply put, Pang on the GX4000 is one of my favourite games of all time. And I hope it becomes one of yours.